Time to bring my first guest. Joining me now is the Australian's Washington correspondent, Adam Crate. And Adam, thanks so much for joining us here. Huge, huge yeah. week. Let's start with Prime Minister Anthony Very Albanese's state <laughs> visit in Washington. Tell us about the visit. All went smoothly? Yes, look, it was a fantastic visit, I think. I mean, it was a big success. It was certainly long. It was four full days. I think the Prime Minister actually left just a few hours ago. His last formal function was at the State Department in this gorgeous Benjamin Franklin dining hall, uh, where he was welcomed by Kamala Harris, the Vice President, and also the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken. He spoke very well. Uh, look, I mean, he spoke well throughout the whole trip. Uh, so I think it's a big success for him. I mean, whether that that plays domestically well back home, I suppose, remains to be seen. But, I mean, he couldn't have asked for a better trip. And indeed, the weather here, everyone was talking about it all week. It really was very sublime. Well, that's great. But then there were some other interesting myths about the diplomacy here, especially around China. And Joe Biden cautioned Australia mm. against fully trusting China. Now, do you think that had to do anything with the, with the Albanese government's moves to normalize, smooth out relations, and some of the disputes about whether or not that Port of Darwin lease would be allowed to continue. Hmm. Yeah, certainly there was no mention, publicly at least, of the Port of Darwin situation, but certainly some of the American administration would be concerned about this uh, move to normalization. But I think there's an understanding as well that uh, for Australia, China is a very, very important economic partner. And so we have to kind of straddle these two worlds, both, you know, kind of being an ally of the United States, but also we have to maintain our economic relationship. It's it's very difficult. Uh, you know, if, I think the Albanese government so far is is uh, treading a reasonable path. I mean, I don't know about the Port of Darwin thing. I, you know, maybe wouldn't have approved that. But, but uh, <laughs> more or less, uh, China seems to be taking off its tariffs and so forth, which is a good thing economically. Uh, but of course, we have to be careful. And that's what President Biden said, that we have to, you know, we have to trust, but verify. They were his words. And now, Anna, those are Reagan's words, too, about the Soviet Union, quite famously. But knock us also through some of the congressional jitters that have been vibrating out of Washington around the AUKUS deal. Um, is there an actual threat to AUKUS? Could Republicans take it down because they're concerned, what, about the ability of the U.S. to build its own submarines? Well, it's really interesting, this situation, because if you talk to administration officials and very senior ones, uh, such as Kurt Campbell, who I spoke to just a few hours ago, actually, at the function uh, that I just mentioned, he's extremely confident that all the relevant legislation will be passed uh, this year. Uh, and that's the same message that you'll get from Carolyn Kennedy and from other senior figures. So the administration is very confident. But if you talk to analysts on the ground in Washington, they say that when push comes to shove, the US is going to be unwilling in a few years' time to part with what would be about 10% of its submarine fleet because uh, so much of the US uh, submarine fleet is, is, um, is currently in for maintenance and so forth and it's well behind production schedule. I think they're building something like 1.2 submarines a year when they really need to be, uh, to be building at least two. Uh, so there's a huge number of bottlenecks here. So, so there's a real contrast. And look, I mean, I'm not a... I mean, I can't predict the future, but certainly uh, the Prime Minister is confident too, as you suggested. He met all of those congressional uh, leaders just, uh, just this morning and also yesterday, and they said all the right things. Uh, so, look, it remains to be seen over the next few years. Uh, sorry, a few months, I should say. I got to say, Adam, you're just having read history. The 1930s and the fights to get everybody's navies into shape really sort of <laughs> ring very resonant here. But I want to move on to the Middle East. We had the questions, you know, uh, around Israel. We saw Joe Biden this week, I thought, being very strong on Israel and its right to defend itself. Was there any discussion between Albanese and Biden on this? And does that put Albanese in a funny position, given the problems he's been having in Australia with his Labour caucus on Israel? Mm. Well, look, I think the two leaders uh, share the same problem, that there's a small element in both of their left-wing parties that are very pro-Palestinian, and they do exert some force. Indeed, you saw the president uh, just a few days ago at his joint press conference. I think for the first time, he was mildly critical of Israel, well, at least of the settlers anyway. He said that it was pouring gasoline on the fire, so to speak, uh, to be expanding further into the West Bank. And that's the first time that he said something like that. Uh, he also re reiterated the US's support for a two-state solution. Uh, so I thought that was uh, that was kind of a move away, uh, you know, a small step back, if you like, from his, uh, from his stronger address a week ago. Mm. Uh, look, I'm sure they talked about it. I mean, Australia, as you know, is a very strong supporter of, you know, kind of whatever the US does uh, globally and... Certainly, we're providing humanitarian aid, just as we are with Ukraine. Uh, so, yeah, so I, you know, I don't think the U.S. is upset with our position. 
Yeah, yeah no, yeah. fair enough. And finally, I want to ask about this horrible shooting in Maine. Um, and there's a whole lot of questions being raised about it. I mean, we have at least 18 dead at this stage, maybe more. The shooter, the alleged shooter, um, apparently was an Army reservist who told Army doctors and was briefly hospitalized about saying that he'd heard voices basically telling him to shoot up the Army base. At the same time, you've got mm. Kamala Harris now using this to say, well, the U.S. should have an Australian-style gun ban. And she spoke mm. quite forcefully saying that the U.S. should go down mm. that road, which I'm not sure how they would ever practically do that. How are the politics playing out on this? And is this going to be more than just, you know, another one of these mass shootings that comes up, happens, and then people move on to the next mm. thing. Well, look, uh, certainly, you know, these, these shootings are all too frequent, and it's a great tragedy. It's a shocking atrocity, and, and to some extent it overshadowed the uh, last part of the Prime Minister's trip. Uh, but, yes, every time something like this happens, it's almost immediately politicised, uh, you know, whether it's the race of the shooter or the policies of the state. And so straight away here, you've seen a lot of people blaming uh, the Republican Senator Susan Collins uh, from uh, from the state of Maine, because apparently a few years ago, she, you know, she wouldn't, she didn't support tougher uh, rules around gun purchase. But look, I think it's very unseemly to do this, so even though it happens all the time, you know, trying to draw a bow between a particular rule and then some psycho out there in the community who's just mm. done this uh, shocking thing. Uh, so, look, I mean, it's not going to change US policy. As you alluded, you know, there's, there's going to be no change, no substantive change. The reality of the United States is that there's hundreds of millions of guns floating around and the horse is well and truly bolted, I think, for gun control. I mean, you know, you can try at the edges, but, you know, sadly, the U.S. has got itself in this position where, you know, you have a massive country, a massive population, you know, what is it, 340 million, and even a small percentage of psychos are going to, you know, will obviously sure. cause a lot of damage periodically. You know, you know, it's, a, you know it's a shocking tragedy.